Today I have an exclusive opportunity to talk to Dr. Nubar Afeyan. Mr. Afeyan is best known for co-founding the biotechnology company Moderna. Uh, Mr. Afeyan is also co-founder of Aurora Humanitarian Initiative. Uh, welcome to our program, Mr. Afeyan. Now uh, let me st uh, start by asking you, in the last weeks we heard a lot about new project which is called uh, future Armenia, and as I understand, you are uh, trying to identify the challenges facing Armenia in the future, the ways to address those challenges and set the goals that could take us to a much better Armenia. Would you tell us a little bit more? What is this all about? Sure, thanks, uh, thanks for having me. Um, let me first start by uh, saying that uh, our, our activities uh, over the last 20 years in Armenia that started out with Armenia 2020 project eventually led to several additional projects together with Ruben Vartanian, my partner in this, and several others. Um, we formed the IDEA Foundation. We launched projects like the UWC Dilijan School, the Datev Aerial Tramway, FAST, the Foundation for Armenian Science and Technology, and several others of which Aurora was the the, the, the one project that was international in nature and aimed at humanitarian relief and humanitarian issues. The most recent initiative that you spoke of actually didn't stem from Aurora, but rather stemmed from the continuation of this 20 year journey we've been on. In particular, we about a year and a half ago started talking about Armenia 2041. This is when Armenia would become the, the last Republic would be 50 years old and starting to think ahead again, like we did 20 years ago, about what are the choices in the future. Mm -hmm. When we started, we did not anticipate a pandemic. We did not anticipate the war in Artsakh, and we certainly did not anticipate the political fallout and the instability that we perceive today. So over the last few months, as uh, uh, Ruben and I and several colleagues uh, joined uh, in a set of discussions, we began to realize that we really needed to focus a dialogue and some projects on what that future could be. And that's how the project Future Armenian was born. It was really out of a necessity, out of the moment in time, and out of the realization we had that while every time Armenians talk, they're comfortable talking about our, our, our past, which is often painful, or our present, which is sometimes painful, but we really hardly ever talk about our future. Uh, and we wanted to create a channel, if you will, a, a way, a forum in which the future can be discussed, not as dreams and aspirations, but as specific intentions, specific destinations, specific choices. And that's what this Future Armenian Project really is all about, is to create a collective strategy for the future of Armenia and Armenians all around the world, because I think these two things have to be uh, uh, envisioned as two parts of the same whole. Uh -huh. well, we lost the war to our neighbors, and uh, Azerbaijan and Turkey were coming out of the health, health crisis after the pandemic, the economy is in the free fall, the political crisis is getting worse, and Aurora Foundation has launched a new project as we said, about Armenia's future. Uh, why have you decided to identify the problems? However, the goals and the ways of achieving the goals of Armenia's future, why not try to come up with a plan uh, uh, for pulling out Armenia from the current crisis? It seems to me that you are shying away, uh, not only you, but uh, Ruben Vartanian and others, uh, from the current uh, situation in our, to talk about the current uh, situation in Armenia or uh, to come up with uh, uh, your capable people and your talented people with a lot of financial resources, with a lot of uh, know-how. Why don't you just come up with the something, something uh, to pull out the country out of this terrible crisis? Well, look, I understand the sentiment, and I think that uh, we all feel a great degree of uh, nervousness and, and, and concern about the present situation 
and it's very unclear where this is all headed. Um, but I think it's important that uh, you and everyone understand what issues are in the domain of which uh, different types of players in any given situation. Uh, we are not political entities. We are individuals, private sector, philanthropists, entrepreneurs, and as such, let alone living in the diaspora, as such, uh, our projects aimed at helping the situation now require an agreement on where we are headed, which we've basically never had. And one of the realizations we've had is that simply doing projects in the present, hoping it makes things better, when in fact there are fundamental disagreements about what kind of country we're trying to build, makes it a bit of a waste of effort. And, and we've experienced that in many, many ways over the last 20 years, and so have or many others. So from where we sit as non-elected, non-political agents, it's very important for us that whatever we do in the present collectively takes us to a future that we can agree on. If we simply try to fix the present, we will stay in the same crisis. It'll be another one and another one because there's no place that we're going. We're just basically trying to to put a Band-Aid on a situation, as, as they say in, in English. So I, I really would say that there's two approaches to transformations. One is you work on the present and the future is whatever the future is. The other is that you plan for a better future and everything you do in the present aims for that better future. In my experience, in the experience of many others, the latter is a better way to truly bring about change, not optical change, not change in the way people can make statements and speeches, but true, true change. If we don't agree on where we're going, it's very hard to agree on how to get there. And so while I understand the pain, I understand the crisis and confusion and need for help and support, frankly, that is the job of the current government and whoever is in government. That is the job of the current aid organizations who are helping in the country. But I believe that the job of Armenians in general is to own the future collectively, is to have a stake in where we're going, not simply say, who cares where we're going? Let's just fix our, our daily problems and then the future will take care of itself. It's just not how that works. Uh, Dr. Afem, now there is the debate in the country about whether we have future or not. Uh, there is even a slogan, Armenia has a future. And surprisingly, a lot of people are skeptical about this, branding it as a government propaganda. What are you going to say to millions of disappointed people who are considering leaving the country? Can you convince them that we have at least better future, if not the bright future? Well, I've seen that I've seen the political slogans, I've seen the posters, and I think it's a um, it, it's a, it's a it's unfortunate that people are discussing whether there is a future or not. Of course, there's a future. The question is: Is it the future we want? Is it the future we wrote, or is it a future other people wrote for us? And so the question isn't: Is there a future? The question is: Are we living in the future that we want? And that seems to me what a choice is all about, what, what leadership is all about, is to offer a future that we want. And to do that, you have to present concrete ideas on that future and to get political support, popular support, and importantly, in my view, the support of all Armenians. Uh, that's something that we can come back to that's been completely absent. In, in, in the development of Armenia, there's been a focus on the here and now and whoever can get elections but not where are we going and how does this affect Armenians all around the world. If we want the actual investments, sustainable investments and, and participation of diaspora and Armenians, we have got to give them a voice in what this future looks like. I'm aware in the country of many people who have criticized the idea that the diaspora should care about Armenia's future and should have a voice in Armenia's future. I happen to be, Ruben happens to be, many others of our colleagues in the opposite camp of that. Because if we're going to tell diaspora and Armenians, 
come and give us your expertise, your money, your support, your, your children who may want to move here, but then you have no say in where Armenians are going in the future. That's not going to work. So I think the, the, the question you asked, what can I say to disappointed Armenians? I would simply say the road to go from where we've been historically, survivors of a genocide, survivors after the earthquake, survivors after the Soviet Union collapsed, and lo we lost a large chunk of our GDP, continuously standing up on our feet uh, and trying to get better and better, more and more relevant to the region, to the world. We had a long road. I, I would say that if we're going to judge how we're doing on that road this week, this month, this year, it's not a practical way to view uh, a country's development. A country's development takes many, many years, decades. We are uh, 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 partway in this journey, 30 years. We had a setback. This year was difficult for the whole world. It was particularly difficult for Armenians. But at the end of the day, we have to say, can we ensure that a better future comes? It does. It's not up to me. It's not up to any other individual. It's up to the collective. And the collective minds, the collective work of the different uh, 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 types of people in Armenia, different education, different work, different uh, experiences. If we can pull all that together and discuss and agree on where we should head together, then I think we have, by definition, a brighter future. I would argue that we're not doing that today, by and large, and that's why the future is uncertain, and an uncertain future often looks dark. An uncertain future often looks dark. Look, I've said in the past that I consider developing a country, I consider helping transform a country as something like a form of immigration. It, as somebody living in a country, you go to another country because you think there's a better future there. But if you think there's a better future for you in your own country, then you will immigrate to that better future, not to a different country, but you will actually immigrate that future in your own country. But that takes hard work, that takes coordination, that takes faith, that takes faith that such a thing is possible. And unfortunately, the political situation, the, the geopolitical situation has shaken people's faith. We have to restore it and we have to get on with building the future. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Afen, I would ask one more question related to our past as well. Uh, we were, uh, the Armenian diaspora was focusing mostly on the past uh, which was uh, really justifiable for recognition of, of Armenian genocide, which in itself is very important for, secure, for uh, Armenia's security. Uh, but now we, uh, one of the major, uh, you know, superpower, one of the United States recognized already uh, Armenian, the Armenian genocide, and now we're hoping that uh, at least a diaspora organization in the United States will be more focused on Armenia's immediate needs like security, economy, and other, other issues. What, what do you think about this? Do you think that uh, diaspora should refocus its efforts, uh, uh, redouble it, uh, double its efforts on, on, on these issues, uh, Armenia's security, building armed forces and other mm, important issues that Armenia is facing now? Um, I have felt for 20 years since getting involved in these topics that the diaspora should make its number one objective, ensuring a secure and prosperous future for Armenia. Uh, we have over the years, every project we've done has been about that. Maybe you will know five years ago, we, we spread a a, a, um, a set of announcements to try to attract people to adopt this notion of a global Armenian nation and how can we collectively act together long before the recent crisis. So that need has been there all along. Uh, the diaspora organizations by, the, by in general are reflecting their people, their constituency and their constituency has had a long uh, battle. It will continue to, to have justice done vis-a-vis -vis the genocide. It starts with recognition. But it, but it continues. But I definitely don't think that that's the only thing the diaspora should work on. I don't even think it's the most important thing. It is a very, very important thing. I've lost members of my uh, mother's family in the genocide, and, my, and, and, I, and I come from survivors. So this is an important theme to me. But, but if we are going to do only that, 
if we're going to leave the country to to end up wherever it ends up, I think that is a a real uh, lost opportunity for the diaspora. But I, let me tell you, come back to what I said before, it's really hard for diaspora organizations and the diaspora in general to actually do anything for Armenia in Armenia other than send money, which I understand there are many portions in Armenia of society that think that's the best thing they can do, but that's not a normal relationship between family members. If we are part of the same family, simply saying send us money and come and visit us once in a while is not a practical solution. Yes, we can do charity and people should and, and many, many do, but it doesn't stop with that. If we're going to improve the economy, if we're going to improve the social equality, if we're going to improve the way governance is done, why not? If we're going to improve security, we have to have a dialogue about it. It cannot be a one-way street. Your question about, about whether the diaspora should engage with you know, building a stronger army, etc. Look, I think that there are lines that need to be observed as to what foreign citizens can do in a country and what the country has to do for itself. When it comes to expenditures for the military, I think that our Armenian economy has had, has sufficient capital to be able to properly deploy, uh, uh, build a smart military, a modern military. It's one of the directions of the 15 general goals that we laid out for discussion as part of the Future Armenian Project is actually how to think about protecting ourselves when our sovereignty is threatened. But I think that the primary responsibility there will be on the country, on the leadership, on the military. And of course, with technology, with know-how, with, 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 with networks, there are folks in the diaspora that I'm sure can help. But in general, we need to think about, that's why we need to have a future plan so we know what each of us can do and should do. And, and that's something that has never happened before. Uh -huh. Mr. Afem, we suddenly discovered that security is now number one uh, problem for Armenia. So we, we sort of ignored this issue before. Uh, and now I, what I'm uh, trying to say, your uh, future Armenian project should reflect that as well, right? Uh, well, if in fact it does. In fact it does. One of the important goals we have, now the second goal is what's called assured sovereignty. And it's all about being able to establish a acknowledge, it says acknowledge our threatened security and construct a more effective and forward-looking defense system. It's the number two goal in our set. There's another goal in our set that has to do with Artsakh, number four goal, which is to establish Artsakh's uh, uh, legal status and to ensure its security. And we call that goal free Artsakh in the sense that we have to free it from all the constraints it's been operating under and the uncertainty and the instability that's been imposed on it now even more with the recent war. So it is a very important topic. And look, the reason we have these 15 goals is that any diaspora and any Armenian in Armenia, they should look at all of them. They should ask themselves, where do I have a point of view? Where can I get engaged in support? And even if they choose one or two things, maybe somebody wants to work on excellence in education or somebody wants to work on how to make science and technology and creativity more important in our economy. But they can do those two things, keeping in mind the other 13. And in the other 13 is security, is the good governance, is preserving heritage. So, you know, we can't do this work. You know, if you're gonna build a city, you can't just build one little part and not care about the rest of it. The whole thing has to come together. And, and it's, it's a big, big undertaking. But look, often people ask, what do I know about helping build the country? How do I know about transforming or fixing Armenia? And the answer I usually give them is that, you know, any one of us may not know enough, but nobody knows enough. Nobody knows how to build Armenia. Nobody. Nobody has been educated in how to build Armenia. Each one of these projects, country building projects, is a work of, of passion and it's a work of intellect and it's a work of cooperation, but there's no expertise required. You just have to commit yourself to say, this is an important goal in my life. What can I do to get involved? And that's what we hope people will begin to, to embrace. So the, the project uh, Armenian, uh, the Armenian future is not about Armenia only. It's about, uh, it's a pan-Armenian uh, project, right? That includes yes. diaspora, 
Armenia and everything else that is Armenian. Am I am I correct? Yes, yes, absolutely, absolutely. Look, I'll, maybe I'll even describe it in this way. Sometimes in, in talks I've given in the last couple of years, I've used this expression and people often misunderstand it. So let me let me say it again so they can misunderstand it if they choose to or disagree with it. But basically I tell people that in, in the US, for example, there's an expression that many Armenians use, which is Armenian by choice. Uh -huh. And this is meant to describe people who are married to Armenians, who are friends of Armenians, who feel a special kinship and relationship with Armenians, and they consider themselves Armenian by choice. But over the years, I've come to realize that our biggest challenge is to make every Armenian, every Armenian alive of any kind, an Armenian by choice. Meaning, rather than being satisfied that we're born Armenian, we know a little bit about our culture, history, that's good enough, I'm Armenian, nobody can take it away. No, I would say, I'm born of Armenian parents, my family goes back to Adapazar for hundreds of years in Turkey, but I feel like I'm an Armenian by choice. I choose to spend this time talking to you. I've cho chosen to come to Armenia five times a year in the last 20 years. I'm choosing to spend my resources trying to do projects that can help the country. That's being an Armenian by choice. It's a conscious choice that you put Armenia top of your list of things that you want to commit yourself to. So a lot of people go, how can you say Armenian by choice if you're born Armenian? And the answer is, it's a choice you make as to whether you commit yourself or you just wait for other people to do it for you and then you're surprised why things are not working well. So that's how we become a, a global nation, right? Yeah. That's, that's the yeah. foundation, yeah. yeah. And uh, we are in a geopolitical situation that could be considered uh, uh, the most hostile since the years of genocide and the loss of sovereignty to the Bolshevik Russian in, in 1920. Uh, are you also addressing these issues? And is there something wrong with us? What are we doing wrong? Uh, is our geopolitical behavior wrong or we just can't control our sovereign rights to take necessary foreign policy decisions? Please. Uh, well, I, I, wish, I wish that I considered myself competent to, to evaluate whether what we're doing is wrong or right. What I can tell you is that one of the seven goals that we have put out is what we call strong alliances. It is very clear that if we cannot counter the hostility and the isolation within which we're, we live, and if we cannot gain relevance in strategic partnerships with regional uh, players and global players, we will lose even what we have now. And so the idea of alliances, honest, true, kind of transparent alliances, not secret alliances that we think we can count on and suddenly they don't really come through, that has to be central to any geopolitical strategy of the country. But I'll also say that you know, geopolitical considerations and diplomacy and partnerships are long-term games. You know, we pride ourselves in playing chess. Uh, you don't play chess with three, four moves in your mind in the beginning and then expect that you're going to win. It's a long game. And during the game at any given time, people might feel like you're winning, you're losing, because they don't actually know what the strategy is that you're actually playing out. That's how we got here. We got here because over a long period of time, there were a set of statements made, decisions made, whether to settle, not to settle, who to partner with. And at one point along the lines, these alliances or lack of them exposed our sovereignty and our security. Okay, so that's another piece, another move that has happened. We now have to react to it. We now have to adjust. And if the more we do that with a long-term commitment of ensuring that we can protect ourselves, and I still will repeat, the best way to do that is to have strong bilateral relationships where somebody on the other side sees it in their interest to be partners with you, not because they pity you or because you're so poor that they have to help you, but actually get something from you. So I think there's a lot of work to do. I'm a little concerned in the last year, two years, the degree to which it seems that there's a difference in views between our professional career diplomats and foreign service folks and uh, the government. 
in general. I've not seen that in the past in Armenia, and I think that cannot be a, a good situation. It cannot be that there's strong disagreements on foreign policy that are not worked out and then presented to the people so that people can feel comfortable that we know what we're doing. Mm -hmm. So I hope going forward we bring in professionals again, that we have a, a well-communicated strategy. Some of it will be secret, obviously, because you don't do this all uh, in, 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 in full visibility. But I'll also say, maybe just because you're bringing up this issue, this also takes us to the, to the 15th of the goals, which is not meant to indicate its lack of importance. It's just that something had to be 15, which is that we, we, we emphasize evidence-based decision-making. Mm -hmm. That is, how can we demand from the leadership and from society a level of fact-based decision-making, transparent communication versus illusions and myths. We, there's a lot that's been said recently, we've been saying it for a while, that the, it seems to, to us that the last period exposes a set of beliefs that we were led to have that were not reliable. The question then becomes, what else can we not rely on? Not so we can all feel bad, but so that we can identify them and get to the truth and fix them. So yes, you can talk about corruption. Yes, you can talk about fixing corruption, but one form of corruption is not to know the facts because then you don't know what you can rely on and you make bad decisions and bad decisions lead to bad outcomes and bad outcomes are as hurtful as all the other things that are hurtful in the country that also have to be fixed. So I'm encouraged at the will people have had in the last two years to address some aspects of what hurt us, but there's other aspects of what hurt us that I think need ad additional focus. And one of them is how do we understand facts and how do we force each other to make decisions based on evidence and facts? Um, uh, Dr. Afem, now you talked about uh, diaspora and uh, what is the diaspora's role in this project, first of all, and also uh, what kind of authority you have uh, in this, uh, in, in, in implementing this project? Why would people believe in your project? How would you make it living project of the Armenian nation that is credible and believable. And for example, I, I see uh, the list of uh, people that are taking part in this uh, initiative, in this project, in, in Aurora project in general, and most of them are, are diaspora-based uh, business people or, or intellectuals. Uh, would you please uh, tell us why why is this? Uh, do you have anyone from Armenia? And please answer this question. Yes, Why yes. would people believe in your project? What kind of authority do you have now? And why you don't have any Armenian from Armenia proper in your, uh, uh, in your list of people who are you know, supervising this project? Well, um First of all, we do have, I think we're getting close to uh, 18,000, I think it's a little over 18,000 signatories. Every one of them is a, an actual person. Every one of them voluntarily chose to sign their support for this initiative. They have agreed that they will join discussions. They will consider this directions as important for their work in vis-a-vis -vis Armenia. And the vast majority of the people who signed are living in Armenia. Let me repeat, the vast majority of the people who've signed are living in Armenia, mm -hmm. of all kinds, of all backgrounds, some in the church, some in art, some in architecture, some in, in business, some in many other places, including government. Uh, so first, let me say that this is, this is an important step. The oversight of the project is, 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 is really, right now, the undertaking of those who initiated the project. And Artur Alaverdian, who's originally from Armenia, much of his work is in Armenia. Uh, Richard Azarnia, who's in, who's in France, Switzerland, and has a number of initiatives in Armenia. I think Ruben Vartanian, we can debate where he's based, but he's in Armenia quite a bit more often than he is anywhere else. Um, I, in, in normal times, have, are in Armenia quite often. I live in Boston, I live in the US. And, and right now, this is not a a, a project which has kind of governance in terms of decision making. This is an open project. It's a public project. I know that Armenians are not 
have not seen this type of thing before. But all we're doing is we're laying out these 15 goals and we're going to cause discussions to have happen, to cause people to begin to discuss, debate, and agree on where the future should go. What happens next is where we hope <clears throat> the people in Armenia, whether it's in government or business or intellectuals, take these ideas, contribute to them, but also then help start implementing them with support from anywhere and everywhere in the world. So it's really important to understand we historically, 20 years, we've done projects pretty much on our own. We have collaborated with the government on many of our projects, but generally we have not sought public involvement because we felt that who are we to you know, basically do that? Let's just go do our work and we'll build interesting projects and hope the country advances. I think we've reached a point 20 years in this journey that we've decided that no, we need popular involvement, population level involvement, and we need to make sure that everybody buys in because we're not, we're not, this is not our ideas. These have to be everybody's ideas. And as that happens, we hope these numbers go to 30,000 fairly soon uh, and eventually 100,000 and, and maybe more. If 100,000 people easily who can fill the Republic Square, as we've heard before and seen, uh, are a sufficient number to show representation, then if there's 100,000 people interested in electing a future, not a party or a person, but electing their own future, we think that's an important change in the way we think about who owns the country, who owns the future, and how can change be made. And so we are, I consider myself, I know Ruben does and others, we are essentially trying to facilitate an organic natural process that we hope will lead to a better future, but not the future that we want, but it's the future that the people who participate want. That's really, really important to understand. You know, we as Armenians, we are all cynical and we doubt each other. There's nobody who trusts anybody else, unfortunately. Yeah. We trust our family members and that's it. And that's not going to build a great country. I yeah. guarantee you that's not going to build a great country. As we start trusting each other and trusting the ideas that come from others as, yeah, I believe you, I, I'm happy to work to help get to that place. More and more, I think we will find a cultural change. It might take 10 years, it might take 50 years. But I can tell you from talking to lots of people in many, many other countries, we are not going to have a better future if we have the level of mistrust, doubt, cynicism in everything every other Armenian does. This is a project to also help people realize that. Uh, Dr. Afen, do, you ha do I have uh, you know, time to ask the last question? Or, or... Last question, yes, please. Yes. Uh, very often uh, we build our national identity on mythical beliefs. We strongly believe in our exclusiveness. We believe that we are extremely talented people, that we are capable of doing something extraordinary, that we have created our own civilization. We are proud of being first nation that adopted Christianity officially. We keep repeating the names of our greats like Narek Gatsi, Aram Khachaturian, Charles Aznavour, William Saroyan. Very soon you will also join this list. Uh, but uh, we shy away from our problems that are so common to the third world, to the countries that have been described as a failed state. What's your comment? Well, look, I think it's, a, it's, it's an appropriate uh, observation and criticism and recovery recovery and revival start with self-realization. If we cannot be critical of ourselves, then we have no hope. So I'm happy that you make this observation because that's the collectively, we all have to realize where our limitations are. I happen to believe that we can be uh, um, highly educated. We can be world-class in, in many, many areas. We, all, the potential clearly is there. And, and, and because I, nobody can say why it isn't there, why we can't have world-class composers, world-class chess players, what we already do in some cases. So the question isn't, can we be? The question is, are we? And the mistake we make is that in our belief that we can be, we think we already are. So it's really more yeah. about us estimating properly just how far we are from where we need to get to versus just asserting that we're there because we have some special special talent or special right. 
look, Armenians uh, historically for 3,000 years are the product from an evolutionary standpoint of repeated near extinction experiences. We have been nearly wiped out by empire after empire. We have found a way to survive. We've made compromises. We've found words. We have married people in other uh, 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 clans in order to make peace. We have made do when we took Christianity over, you know, in, as to a, a national state, it created even more hostility for hundreds and hundreds of years. We still pay a price for having a distinct religion in a, in, in a region that is, that is unfortunately can be hostile on those issues, uh, including 100 years ago with the genocide. So we are the product of survival, revival, then again survival, then again revival. We barely have had time to thrive. We barely have had a peaceful period where we can start thinking about how can we contribute again? How can we be great again? But I think that struggle actually has made us who we are and is a strength. In other words, I do believe not that we have some, some you know, uh, 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 historic right to, to have this strength. It's just that history has given us the strength. The people who survived are the people who, who basically are our forefathers who passed on and foremothers who passed on this knowledge, this, this culture of survival and, and, and not giving up and coming back. That is what we need today. That's what we needed 30 years ago. I believe the last 30 years is evidence of our ability to go from what could have easily been a terrible, terrible situation post the Soviet collapse to surely coming back, getting back again, bit by bit, strengthening ourselves. Look, the World Bank, you know, six, seven years ago, wrote a report about the Caucasus tiger describing Armenia as the most rapidly developing, the most clean, transparent economy. That was six, six years ago. I remember well uh, uh, the content of that. So it's all possible, but we have to kind of go back and say, it's up to us. That's the thing that unfortunately, because Armenians have lived for so long under the occupation of foreign leaders and foreign rulers, on the one hand, that's helped us get along because they wouldn't let us fight each other. On the other hand, it's made us comfortable waiting for somebody else to solve our problems. Mm -hmm. And we've always had, whether it was Soviet Union or before that the Ottoman Empire or before that some other people, others have been solving our problems. And only in the last 30 years have we been told, okay, you solve your own problems. And I think the road to solving our own problems and to choosing our own destiny and to working, sacrificing, believing, or, and trusting each other, that's a long journey. And I certainly think that it's a worthwhile journey. It's the only thing that's going to make Armenia strong. But if people quit on that journey or if diasporans, which I'm, I'm equally concerned about, think that this is not our problem since they don't want to hear what we have to say, we'll just care about our own lives and we'll go there once in a while for a fun vacation. That's not the Armenia that I hope we hand to our children. So you asked the question a couple of questions ago, what gives us the right to even think about these things? And I would say the answer is nobody today is speaking on behalf of five-year-olds in Armenia today and in the diaspora. Nobody. Everybody is obsessed with their own lives, their own livelihoods. And we thought if you're going to do charity, if you're going to do philanthropy, pick an audience who isn't underrepresented. And so we're trying to underrepresent, we're trying to represent the piece of society that has no voice, that has no agency today, the, the children, and see if we can figure out together, not ourselves, what would they have wanted us to do? That's the idea. Well said. Thank you very much, Dr. Afian. Thank you.